everyone. Happy Tuesday. We've got a report from the edge for you today. Plus, can you believe we're returning to Three Mile, I- a three mile Island? And what are our best sustainability practices? All this and more, you're watching Tech Strong Gang. Hi, everyone. Alan Schimmel here for Tech Strong. Happy Tuesday to you. We've got a great Tech Strong gang set up for today. As I mentioned in the earlier uh, segment, we're going to talk about Edge and a recent Tech Field Day Edge computing event that our friend Stephen Foskett and the Tech Field Day team conducted. We're also going to talk about a, a new plan. I mean, everybody wants electricity for for data centers. Well, let's let's revive some failed nuclear reactors. That sounds like a plan. What could go wrong? <laughs> and we've got best sustainability practices by our own sustainability analysts, Bonnie Schneider and Josh Harbert. Well, so I guess I gave away Bonnie, <laughs> one of our guests on Tech Strong Gang today. We're going to come back to her in a second. But first, let me mention, well, I mentioned his name too. He is the founder of Tech Field Day, and he's a regular here on the gang, joining us, I think, from home today. It's good to be home. Stephen Foskett. Hey, Stephen, welcome. Absolutely. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. You're supposed to click your heels when you do that. <laughs> How do you know? You can't see my heels? Maybe I can I won't? see you don't have red ruby slippers. Well, if you do, maybe. As a matter of fact, I give you a hundred bucks right now if you pick <laughs> up your feet and there are red ruby slippers on there. I think um, I, I don't want your hundred bucks, so I'm not okay. going to that So we'll just have to keep guessing. <laughs> Welcome, Stephen. Joining Stephen and I today is our uh, tech strong CTO and future of CTA, Mitch Ashley. Hey, Mitchell, how are you? I'm doing great, and I think I have a pair of Crocs on, but they aren't red. Sorry. We would expect nothing less from a bolder person. <laughs> Remember the guy in our uh, in our incubator, the Mobius incubator, whose family invi- invented the things that go in the Crocs. Oh yeah, those little, the little uh, rich, 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 rich right. uh, Schmelzer. Schmelzer, right? Yeah, I was. Yeah. We knew him when. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Rich wasn't successful. His wife and daughter were. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> But anyway, congratulations to them. Joining us here in our Boca Raton headquarters, we'll tell you the Schrelzer story one day. On my, well, on my immediate left, I've already introduced her. She's our sustainability analyst and uh, editor. She's a meteorologist, (laughs) accomplished author, and a bunch of other things, Bonnie Schneider. Hey, Bonnie, how are you? I'm doing well, Alan. Great to be here. Thanks to have you here. And then to my far left, he's our chief content officer. He's moving to New York, but he's back here in Boca because you can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> um, oh, no, that's California. Yeah, that's California. Mike Vizard. Hey, Mike, how are you? Happy to be here, and I am on the edge of my seat. You're on the edge. Yeah. We're all on the edge. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the edge, so, Stephen, you guys did a uh, Edge Tech Field Day. I caught some of it. Um, but why don't you... You know, give a report from the field, if you will, on Edge Tech Field Day. And maybe while you're at it, not everyone out here might be familiar with Tech Field Day. So we should kind of set that table. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, So great to be here, uh, returning to the gang once again. And uh, great to bring a little bit of a report of my takeaways from another Tech Field Day event. Uh, We did the same thing with our AI Field Day recently. Um, and, and so Tech Field Day is a great, uh, great little event that I've been running for 15 years now. Essentially, I pick a panel of people just like the people here on the panel on Tech Strong Gang. In fact, literally just like the people on the Tech Strong Gang, because it's included you and, and Mitch and, and, and Guy Courier and Stephen Dickens and some of the others, Camberley, and um, a- along with a bunch of others. And we fly them to California and then companies present to them over a couple of days. And we live stream the thing on uh, Tech Strong TV. So if you've if you've spotted that on the TechStrong websites or TechStrong TV and wondered what was going on, well, now you know. And if you go to techfieldday.com, you can see a little bit more about the thing. Um, but yeah, the last week was Edge Field Day. Uh, Edge is a, a topic that's really near to my heart because, well, I'm a hardware nerd. 
And uh, ultimately, uh, one of the coolest things about Edge is that there's still a lot of hardware innovation happening. The other cool thing about Edge is that it really encompasses all the different disciplines of IT. I mean, you've got container orchestration, you've got virtualization, you've got physical machines, you've got security and networking and storage. And like I said, even nuts and bolts. And that's pretty cool to hear about uh, across the spectrum there. And that's really what we saw at our Edge Field Day event. I mean, we had companies, you know, like VMware talking about how they're, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny, they um, they brought in a couple of guys dressed as the men in black and, and said, we're not the VMware you think we are, and then proceeded to talk about a completely different Edge platform that VMware by, has uh, within Broadcom. In fact, they're more within Broadcom than within VMware now, which I think is a, is a really interesting move on the part of Broadcom, but also it shows a little bit of support for this uh, sort of alternate VMware product line. Uh, we also talked to our friends from Avasa talking about uh, orchestrating applications at the edge. Uh, they're getting a lot of traction in that space where, you know, allowing companies to uh, deploy applications anywhere. And uh, they, they demonstrated that uh, with actually hardware f provided by uh, another Edge Field Day partner. Um, we also heard from T-Second, who makes an incredible ruggedized uh, military-grade uh, storage brick that can store terabytes, petabytes of data, transport, uh, you know, terabytes per second of, uh, of throughput, um, and, and, and survive basically anything. So if, if you're recording video in the field or collecting data or, I don't know, military, industrial, science, uh, their little brick is, is a pretty cool box for that. And then the next day, we, we heard from Zadata, who are doing um, uh, basically edge at scale. So their thing is that they can, uh, they can deploy across thousands of sites, which is, is pretty awesome. And then finally, OnLogic, uh, you know, they're the partner that uh, everybody partners with. They're a, a, an American company that's manufacturing servers, essentially little uh, ruggedized edge servers. And uh, you'll recognize these little orange and silver monsters basically everywhere you go in industry and retail and restaurants and so on. So it was a pretty cool event. It was pretty neat to, to hear about all this varied stuff at the edge. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's interesting. When I first uh, was introduced to this concept of the edge, I think it was Simon Crosby, Mitch. Uh, you remember Simon from uh, micro perimeters and stuff and security, right? He was at Citrix for a while. And yeah, it's at Citrix. Yeah. You know, and, and in his vision, he thought like some of the cellular carriers would, would have sort of a, like a, a, a freight container, you know, the big containers that you see on ships that yeah. would sit at the bottom of a, of a cell tower and that that would be the, your edge set to your edge data center. So literally an edge data center, the size of a, a, a freight container, and maybe there's still a place for that. But, you know, now we have bricks that have petabytes of, of storage on it. And that, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, the, the orange and silver servers, it reminds me of when we were first starting to do, worry about data set to density. This company, Cobol Networks, came out with those little one U rack mount servers that you could fit. I think it was 40 or 50 into a rack. You can put now an entire system in a box like this in those cell towers. So you don't need a big container. Yeah, no, but that, that you know, right. back then, I mean, this is going back seven years, eight years. This this was the concept of the edge. And um, it, it's amazing to see, like everything else, how it's miniaturized. But I'll tell you something else. Mitchell and I are working on a project with our friends at Cloudflare called The Last Great Cloud Transformation. And it's about something that Cloudflare calls the connectivity cloud, which is the amalgamation of all they do. And... The, the, you know, the thing about the edge on it is the edge doesn't live in a vacuum. No pun intended, right? And it, it, it's not replacing the core. You're going to, you know, we're going to live in a world where you have some things in the core. And AI is a great example of this, right? There are going to be some AI real heavy lifting stuff that you're going to get do at the hyperscaler at the core. There's going to be a lot of AI that for latency 
reasons and everything else you're going to want at the edge. And then there'll be some AI that takes place right on the device. A la, you know, Mitchell and I spent the weekend slacking about Apple intelligence. We've set it up on every device we have because that's how Mitchell and I roll. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it does a damn thing, but whatever. We did set it up. Now, connecting these, connecting And that's where the magic happens, when you connect the edge to the device, to the core, and all of this. So the network piece of this connectivity, and then, of course, the security of it. At its heart, that's that, this connectivity cloud, the cloud. Stephen, Cloudflare should be at this, the next edge tech field day we do. Oh, absolutely. You you know what, Stephen, I'm curious with the, the people that you had at this event were some great companies. You know, the, the edge, it isn't like there's one definition of what the edge is, right? It's, it's you know, one person's edge is a not, not another person's edge, mentioning VMware being there. I'm, I'm curious what kind of use cases or experiences like that did you see where maybe the edge is really different in some domains than others? Oh, definitely. And that's, I you know, I, on Wednesday, uh, before kicking this thing off, I defined the edge more by what it's not than what it is. Uh, the edge is basically not the data center and not the desktop. It is essentially, you know, it, it's everything else. And, and, and in terms of by what it's not too, if we look at the IT attributes of the edge, this kind of goes to what, what y'all are seeing as well. Um, you know, the edge is defined by uh, lack of environmental controls, lack of power controls, lack of connectivity, lack of operational uh, hands-on operational talent, lack of accessibility. And we saw some absolutely incredible uh, customer use cases, uh, you know, devices operating across the, you know, Canada and and and, and in the Arctic uh, with, uh, you know, well, well below freezing temperatures, devices in the desert at, you know, boiling temperatures, you know, it, it, everywhere. And, and certainly there's military, there's industrial edge, there's industrial IoT, uh, we saw a use case that involved mining, another use case that was a, a, a steel smelter that uh, got up to 70 degrees C. Uh, just incredible um, what these systems have to have to endure. And, and, and in terms of even, even sort of mundane things like retail and restaurants and so on, a lot of the time these little servers are sitting underneath the fryers or sitting in the corner uh, with the trash piled on top of them or whatever. There's nobody there to push the button. So a lot of the technologies that we've pioneered uh, in other areas, like zero touch provisioning and um, you know zero trust access and so on, a lot of that stuff is really getting traction at the edge because you know you just can't have a system that 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 needs a lot of babysitting. Also, the same thing with with networking, you know, in, in connectivity that's uh, that's sparse. And one more thing that I'll mention too, uh, to your point about the the containerized data center. One of the biggest thing that's happening at the edge is the virtualization movement. Just like virtualization affected the data center in the cloud, it's really important to virtualize uh, all these devices at the edge as well, because you don't want to have a rack of ten different pieces of hardware to run. You know the, the 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 payment processing, the IoT processing, the camera control, the security system, all these different things. You want that all to be consolidated into a few different servers. Um, I'm also going to give a quick shout out. There's a group called Edge Monsters that is basically our delegates that are involved in this space. And every month they put together uh, an open white paper about various topics of the edge. So if you check out Edge Monsters in your favorite search engine or on LinkedIn, you'll see some really cool stuff coming out of that group. I think we're missing some of the bigger implications on the software side. If you think about it for a minute, we're in the process of uh, processing and analyzing the data at the point where it's created and consumed. So we're going to do a lot more of that at the edge to reduce the amount of stuff that gets sent over the network and back to the cloud. And in many ways, in my mind, the tail is wagging the dog all of a sudden. There might be a lot more processing happening out at the edge than there is in the cloud one day. Especially with AI, inferencing at the edge too, right? Right, Why inferencing not? at the edge is going to be big. It's going to depend on the economics, right? Why do you want to move stuff to the edge? Well, you're going to reduce latency. But if it's prohibitively expensive, we'll be a little more latent, right? Yeah. Um, so you're, you're going to need that, you know, the economics of it are going to have to work. 
But it, it goes to something Stephen said. The edge, the edge is a many faceted thing. Where is the edge? You know, are you close to the edge? Um, I just wanted to throw that little reference no, in I, there. I, I, like I said, I'm I'm on the edge. So. <laughs> oh no, I was I'm a yes head, and that was a big album. But anyway, um, that being said, I I I do think it's that this show that Mitchell and I do called the Last Great Cloud Transformation. I think that it it, it perfectly encapsulates what what's happening here. The edge is going to be the, it's, I don't know if it'll be the last, because who knows, but it's the next great cloud transformation. It's going to change the way we look at cloud and we, it, everything doesn't have to be in that core data center anymore. Nope. Um, let's take a break here on Tech Strong Gang. We're going to come back. And I feel like we, I, we need a Saturday Night Live skit here or something. Remember they used to do the good three mile alley? Well, you guys may not remember. I'm that old. But they used to do some good three mile island skits on Saturday Night Live. And uh, we'll hear what's go. What what the next plan is for Saturday, for three mile island, not Saturday Night Live. You're watching Tech Strong Gang. In a world where every line of code powers the future, every keystroke can introduce new threats. As software evolves, so must security. It's time to rethink how we protect our digital world. Join the leaders in DevSecOps and AI at the OpenText DevSecOps Virtual Summit on September 24th. Discover how innovation is transforming software delivery faster, more secure, and smarter. From AI-driven security to the truth behind cloud security, get the insights that will keep you ahead of the curve. Don't just watch the future unfold. Be part of it. Register now and secure your place in tomorrow's world. All right, folks. And as promised, we're back. And Microsoft is talking about licensing some data center energy capabilities from uh, what was formerly known as Three Mile Island. That's now the, uh, what did you say, Stephen Crane? Crane Clean Energy, emphasis on clean. Crane Clean Energy Center. I think Stephen Foskett knows which, better. Which we'll get Stephen to kind of explain, but it's a rehabilitation project at the very least. And of course, Microsoft isn't the only people talking about this. Oracle at their event was talking about how they might have many nuclear reactors attached to data centers. And Stephen, what is your sense of what's going on here? I mean, can uh, everybody have a a nuclear data center in their backyard? And are, are you ready to put one in there in Cleveland? <laughs> we already got a nuclear center here in Cleveland. Um, yeah. But uh, what I'll say is, uh, I, again, I'm, I'm not going to bore you all by saying solar, 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 like I do every time on Textron Gang. Let's talk nuclear. Um, so first off, Nuclear is actually a great power source, especially for data centers, because it's reliable. It is non-polluting, asterisk, sort of, kind of, I'll let you argue that out. It is, uh, you know, carbon neutral, again, in terms of point source. And, um, of course, it's actually a fairly proven and reliable technology. So they're going to be restarting uh, Three Mile Island, just for context. My understanding is that... Uh, you know, Three Mile Island shut down, uh, I think, in only, only, only in 2019 uh, because of the economic situation of the cost of power. And now they're going to be restarting uh, what they had running there until very recently. Um, I, I love the fact that they're calling it the Crane Clean Energy Center because uh, anyone from Baltimore knows the CP Crane plant was this horribly blighted, polluted uh, waterfront park. Uh, same guy. It's named after the same guy. Um, it's now a park. That's nice. Um, so basically, yeah, we're going to be using nuclear energy for uh, for our data centers. And the Microsoft angle is really cool, too, because those are small modular reactors, which is a another really cool thing that they're looking into there, where they would actually be deploying small um, industrially manufactured uh, nuclear reactors right there at the data center, which that's Oracle, not not Microsoft. Oh, my, yeah. Oracle. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting you mentioned the micro reactors because um, I would say maybe six, seven months ago, I did an interview with a company that has since gone public um, after that interview. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Um, it's called uh, Nanonuclear Energy, and they specialize in those 
portable microreactor units. And they told me that a lot of it is because of the data centers and the need um, for that. And now, here, I, I thought they were putting them on DeLorean cars. It was 6.7 <laughs> gigawatts. Or but whatever. It's, he mentioned Three Mile Island. And one of the questions I had for them at the time, because I think it's just embedded in us of how do you get beyond this PR issue of, well, nuclear Three Mile Island, we're going to have an accident. It's not going to be safe. And um, the the gentlemen that I interviewed were saying um, new energy, the green energy, like getting it rebranded, like you were saying, um, is one way to get around it. But I think it's going to be all hands on deck in order to power these data centers. It will be solar and, and, and wind um, and nuclear is coming into play more and more. It looks like, especially with the success I've seen of this recent company. <laughs> we actually have a lot of experience with this in space, right? The, the Mars rover probes that go into space, most of those have nuclear reactors, self-contained nuclear reactors that are designed, you know, to live a certain life. And of course, there we're expending them out in space. But it makes it makes a lot of sense, especially um, in a dynamic situation. A lot of we were talking about the edge before. Um, if you need power for a, a data center that you're setting up in a container, I mean, shipping container or something like that, a pod at a remote location that doesn't have power to it, you know, middle of the desert, whatever it might be. That's a great solution for it to have a modular reactor kind of option. So I would expect we're going to see, I don't know if it's going to proliferate. We're all going to have our own, you know, backup power supplies or modular nuclear reactor in the backyard quite yet. But um, I think there's a lot of commercial industrial and military applications of this. Yeah, that hey. company, I just want to mention, they they just got a contract with um, a German uh, government um, in that area, in um, which we're talking about with space and everything. So, yeah, I, I think that's going to be the growth area. I'm having a hard time picturing the town meeting where I go and the local supervisors are trying to explain to everybody that we're going to put a nuclear reactor in to help out the data center. and. I got a feeling everybody in the town is pretty much going to go, I don't think so. Maybe go fight in another well, town. Nibbies. But so here's here's where I am. First of all, I don't think we laid it out right fully for folks. What it is is Microsoft is building a new data center near Three Mile Island, and they've contracted to use all of the electricity that this nuclear data center is going to put out for the next 20 years. Or consume, or something like that, right? And I, it's enough to power eight hundred thousand homes. Wow, it's a lot of electricity. Now, we've made a lot of progress in our nuclear reactor design from the early '60s when Three Mile Island was originally, early to mid '60s when Three Mile Island was originally designed and, and construction started there lot of progress. And I, I read a great article this weekend on nuclear fusion. And and they're saying we will have some commercial fusion plants in the mid-30s, just in time for quantum computing, if you believe that. Um, so I am not against nuclear. However, the child of the 70s that I am who whose brilliant idea was it to go back to Three Mile Island? This is the this is the ultimate boogeyman of the nuclear industry. I don't give a, sh a I don't care what name you want to call this thing. It's still Three Mile Island. There was a we popular had the, movie. We, we the had China the Michael Douglas movie exactly. Right. Right. Did, did you forget the movie? Who, I wouldn't want to touch this radioactive beast with a 10-foot pole. Why would you do this? Go build something fresh and new. Maybe the price was right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, I feel like John Belushi. You know, they're smoking might, dope might, in Mexico. I might not get the electricity in time to drive my AI revenue model if I go build Maybe, maybe, but this is, this is just, look, this is a disaster waiting to happen, I'm telling you. Picture so maybe a, end, literally, <laughs> maybe a PR <laughs> disaster. A um, PR, it's a right. PR hurdle. I sure. said, how do, can you imagine the poor marketing shook this round up on their desk? And he said, wait a second, what could I rename it? What uh, could I rename it? And in the ultimate irony, he said, let me give it to him. Good. I'll name it for that guy, Charles Crane, that bastion champion of clean <laughs> energy. 
Look what they did for Baltimore. Everyone who's in that park, God knows what we'll find out in 20 years. It may it may not be a good look for AI either because people will start equating AI with nuclear in Three Mile Island and they're going to go, you know what? Maybe we'll slow down. Well, you just AI hit it. It's okay to equate it with nuclear. Let's equate it with new nuclear, fresh nuclear, safe nuclear, not Three Mile Island. <laughs> Well, like this on, Oracle, guys. like this Oracle story, exactly. I mean, you've got yeah, these Oracle sounds reactors. cool. They've got much, you know, they're they're a, a modular design. They're easy to maintain. They're easy to run. They're you know a lot less expensive. I think I, I think you we should also give a reality check too. The reason Three Mile Island was shut down is not because of the accident. I mean, it's important to understand the accident actually was a, a proof of the success of nuclear safety because it did not. Meltdown, totally meltdown. But but they did close one of the three reactors. Well, yes? yeah, they closed the one that was damaged. But yeah. um, but the important thing is that to 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 note is that it was it's the the uh, uh, economics of nuclear that didn't work out, not the safety. It's the economics. This this station was running. It says um, I looked it up here. It says that it was running at forty four dollars per megawatt hour, which is significantly more expensive than natural gas plants. Significantly more. I, I'm sorry, I have to say it way more expensive than solar. And, um, and, and Microsoft just signed a 20 year lease on at a, at a very high price for electricity. This may actually be more of a disaster in terms of contract and finance than in terms of anything related to nuclear safety. Unless they know how much those AI prompts are going to cost in the future as they keep building. No, no, I AI saw models. the new, the, um, What's the NVIDIA new set? Ro not Rockwell. Mitch, you remember the name? Whatever the new NVIDIA chip says. Blackwell. Blackwell. Yeah. What did they say? It was 100? 100 megawatts or something? It's going to cost a lot to run one of those puppies, yeah. is the bottom line. And so you're going to need this. But I, as I say, I'm not against nuclear. I think we've made a ton of progress. I just don't know whose bright idea was it to, to recommission Three Mile Island. That That's just, I so, don't know. Let me just ask a, a question here. So will you trust ChatGPT to answer the question, how much radiation is safe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was in fact it was ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot. Yeah, you have to have the right prompt, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, in the same vein, Stephen, you love this. I I read another interesting story this weekend that um, I think it was Columbia University and a university over in China came up with this fantastic idea of installing 51 billion, 51 billion with a B, solar panels to over the over highways. Mm -hmm. Right over our interstate highway system, if you make it high enough for trucks to get in there and you install like a solar power, you know, a lattice that you put solar panels on, they think we can replace 60% of our energy needs with that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, Stephen, I feel like every company out there is betting on all forms of power sources. They're looking at hydrothermic, geothermic, whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> Grease lightning. <laughs> so, I mean, is it is is this like an either or conversation or is it all of the above? I think it's all of the above. And I think that there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, you know, one of the nice things about nuclear is that it operates 24 seven. It's a very steady uh, power source, unlike frankly, almost every other power source. I mean, one of the one of the reasons that, frankly, natural gas is so attractive is because you can spin up and spin down the natural gas generator. Um, you can adjust the power output literally in seconds, which is something that's very useful. And I think that we're going to continue to use natural gas for um, kind of filling in the gaps in energy for a long time. And you mentioned that there's all these other ones. Absolutely. Um, you know, geothermal uh, costs a lot, but is very low, you know, pollution, um, you know, solar is is very inexpensive now but of course it only works when the sun's out and so we have to have batteries and batteries add to the cost and so there's i think we're going to have a very uh, distributed and diverse energy system and i think that it makes sense to have nuclear in there as one of the options as sort of the base uh, generating load especially if we can make it uh, less expensive and and more reliable and remember too one of the reasons nuclear is so expensive is permits 
and NIMBYs. Regulatory. And, you know, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's just one nuclear plant that's been built in the last few decades in the U.S. because nobody wants to add a new nuclear plant because of the worries about Three Mile Island. And that's what drives up the cost of it. Yeah. I Look, my, my personal opinion is, I think, as I said, we've come a long way on fission. Fusion, fusion's a game changer. That, that's what I... He's been chasing fusion for decades, so... Yes, I know. It's always just out of reach. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think this segment's just about out of time. <laughs> so we're going to take a break here on Texture and Gang, and we're going to come back, and we're going to stay on this green theme for today. And Bonnie's going to talk to us a little bit about best sustainability practice, practices. You're watching Textron Gang. Discover Textron Group, the epicenter of tech innovation. We're your go-to for reaching IT leaders and practitioners worldwide. Our secret? Impactful content that sparks awareness, engagement, and top quality leads. With us, You'll access editorial websites, streaming videos, virtual events, custom content, analyst research, and more. Join our satisfied clients. Let's revolutionize your tech journey. Contact us today and tell your story to the world in the most powerful way with TechStrong Group. Welcome back to the Tech Strong Gang. Well, I had the pleasure of speaking with Josh Harbert, who is the SVP and CMO of Couchbase, but he's also one of the co-founders of a really interesting organization called sustainableit.org. And if this does name doesn't sound familiar to you, it's because it hasn't been around too long. They actually started this uh, organization, a uh, nonprofit, it, right around the time of COVID, so just a few years ago. And the concept came from what can we do to make IT more sustainable? And it really blew up from there. Now they have uh, chapters and, and people from all over the world that are involved in this organization. So sustainable IT involves best practices to be more sustainable, whether it's green software, open source, AI, of course. I talked with Josh about all of these things and where he sees the future going and how IT practitioners can learn more about being green with their development. Some people probably are not familiar with sustainableit.org. I know you're a founder of the organization. It's almost been three years, not quite. Uh, we needed to advance sustainability globally and that we need a technology leader to play an active role in it. So almost three years. And the initial mandate was going to be around telling stories. And it very quickly turned to we needed to establish a standard for technology, for their departments, for their business, and really for their industries. The second was build a community. Too many of these organizations were doing things in isolation. They were almost afraid to share their stories around sustainability. Third was around education, and we're just now starting to really evolve that. Uh, we have a really strong community. We offer all sorts of webinars and other programs to be able to deliver to our membership and beyond. Uh, but we're going to continue to evolve with education, meaning up-leveling skills and get everybody within their departments to talk about sustainability. And then I think lastly, is one that we're still pretty immature on, but we've had made a lot of progress, is really in the transparency piece. And that's establishing the benchmarks, right? We're not going to be the one that set the benchmarks, but we want to make sure that we're uh, leaders and making sure folks are starting to measure and make improvements. Can you talk more about those standards that you mentioned? Our audience is filled with IT practitioners, and they may be unfamiliar with the standards and, and the practices of being more sustainable. Donna, well, these are open standards. And for, for us, again, this was about IT's ability to really describe three core areas. Obviously, environmental is what everybody's honing in on now. And we've got a set of 240 different metrics that we outline. And, and this is all available on sustainableit.com. You just click on standards and everybody can go through these. But it's environmental, so and governance. We also have those that are centered around you know, social. So what are some of the things that we're doing to help IT measure technology accessibility? It could be technology partner diversity, a lot of uh, visibility that's happening today around all of these European directives, whether it's the CSRD or the due diligence directive, some of these things are about how are you sourcing? And it's not just about the materials, it's about the uh, overall you know, supply chain that you're driving. We make these standards real for IT and for IT leaders and practitioners to start to understand how they should categorize and start to look at the structure of these metrics for the organization. That's great. Well, you mentioned the corporate reporting and the ESG mandates and things that are happening. A lot of it's in Europe, but it's certainly coming to the U.S. And 
in 2025, we'll have new regulations and deadlines to meet. Has that spurred a little bit more urgency in this movement? It has. And listen, you're right. Europe is, certainly has a little bit of a, a head start, if you will, around their sustainability initiatives. And some of it has been because of the, the regulations. And some of it is just simply because of the best practices that they believe in. So it's created urgency around it. I think secondarily, I mean, just forget about ESG or any of the acronyms that people want to use. Companies are orienting around it, not just because it's the right thing to do, because their employees are really pushing them. Yeah. That's a great point about employees. I've found that too in the research that I've done. People are pushing it from the outside and from the inside. So how would you say sustainability in IT marries with the overall corporate sustainability package within an organization? Well, I think, look, there's certainly the, the ability to manage the data in a consistent manner. So, I mean, I think the strategy has to be paid off by technology. We've made some commitments to COP29. We participate in the World Economic Forum because there's a lot of strategic discussions that are happening around this problem that they're going to require technology to go solve. Big things. CIOs and CTOs have to be part of that discussion. Companies are starting to realize that as these technology leaders are becoming part of the conversation. It's really incredible to watch the success and the and the way this organization has been embraced. I've been following it for a while, and in just maybe the past few months, they've been invited by the UN to be part of Climate Week and the organization's involvement there and in policy. So there's going to be a conference next month in Austin around this topic as well. This is really a growing movement. And it's not just IT workers that you're going to see that are part of it. There are executives from companies from all over the world that are um, wanting just to be more sustainable and learn best practices. So the standards that I mentioned in the video are on their website. They're trying to uniform these metrics for people to practice. I mean, I know, Alan, you knew one of the, you know, one of the co-founders as well. Yes. Yeah, it was. Uh, oh, darn you put Delphix. me on the, the yeah. CEO founder of Delphix. He yeah. really was the guy who, yeah. who started this. I think it's great. I got to tell you the truth. I still can't get over this three mile aisle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here. This is like an Easter egg that they named it for this guy, Craig. Like what name could I come up with that would really, anyway, let, the, but you know what? For every three mile island kind of folly, we do get something like sustainableit.org. And, and I'll tell you something, having spoken to the guy from Delphix years ago about this during COVID, it's, this is something, that it's time has come, the time is now, the place is now, we, we need this done. Um, I think for all the reasons that we just spoke about, all the and we've been talking about it for weeks, data centers and AI energy consumption and everything else, we've got to get serious about green IT and being more um, mindful of, of you know, the impact on our environment that all of these great technologies have. In the age of nuclear IT, I'm not sure green is the right phrase anymore, though. Uh. <laughs> Would you prefer neon or yeah, glowing green? Yeah, neon. <laughs> yeah, is, is it Jedediah? Is that or your Jedediah of? is the Delphix fellow. You know what's really also interesting about this from exploring it is that it's not just these leaders that come together; it's coming internally. All the employees are pushing the the uh, leadership to do this, so it's really a uniform movement that's across the board. And and all I was just fascinated by all the different types of companies that are involved with it. It's not just software and IT. It's consumer companies and things like that. And Stephen, I know you know a lot about this as well. Yeah, I'm very excited about what's going on with sustainable IT. Um, the, 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 this organization, as you mentioned, um, the thing that gets me about them is that they're not just, you know, about, you know, they're not just chatting and, and blabbering about, oh, we wish. There's a lot of muscle behind this thing. I mean, number one, as you pointed out, the variety of companies that are involved in sustainable IT is just kind of mind boggling it and, and, and across the spectrum of various industries. I mean, they've got case studies um, from, uh, you know, Sunbelt Rentals and Rackspace and ADP and all these things on their website. The other thing that's get, that, that I really like is the fact that they're trying to define standards and metrics so that you can actually compare organization to organization how you're doing on these things. Now, some of these, I think, are going to be pretty sad. I want to uh, specifically call out SITEE230, 
which is the standard for eco-friendly business travel, which let me tell you is going to be ugly because there's just no way to have sustainable business travel that doesn't involve horses. And especially um, as you go higher up. <laughs> exactly. As you get above the earth, it becomes less and less sustainable. But the thing is, they're measuring this stuff and they're going to be reporting on this stuff. And I'm starting to look at these uh, companies as we're going to these analyst days. I mean, you know, Alan, Mitch, I mean, you, you know, we, we, I've seen you guys at these analyst days and I've seen you guys asking the question, uh, you know, tell me about, you know, the, the sustainability. Tell me about your sustainability goals. Tell me about your sustainability report. And they're becoming more and more um, nuanced and more and more specific. So Bonnie, one of the things that you've talked about quite a lot is scope one versus scope two and three. And the companies are starting to report on that. And I think that that is the result of initiatives like this to open their eyes and, and, and really have a conversation about sustainability instead of just sort of waving a magic wand and saying, yeah, we're green. Yeah, exactly. Having having those metrics are, are a big deal and the, those standards, those that's all new. That's all coming out now. And just this week, I mentioned Climate Week. It's Climate Week in New York. And this week, Sustainable IT has a whole program. They're involved with the UN, as I mentioned, on global initiatives for um, IT sustainability. I was telling Josh that it's it's hard to believe this in three years, like the, the amount of um, explosive growth that they've had in membership and interest and everything, and also from governments. So interesting to watch. So, Stephen, how detailed are those reports? Because sometimes I feel like, you know, we'll hear somebody put out a statement about their sustainability initiatives and on page 42 in a footnote, it'll say, you know, and we bought a boatload of carbon credits from Elon Musk and we're good. <laughs> Elon is in the like, carbon credits. <laughs> Well, I would say that uh, the the nice thing about sustainability, uh, sustainableit.org, is that they're trying to make them very detailed and specific. They've got specific metrics, like I said, numbered metrics with units, with, uh, and, and I think that the goal there is to kind of push the, the, the industry forward a little bit so that they can't just wave their hands, so that they have to, you know, I mean, it's the equivalent of like miles per gallon, you know, you have to have a specific metric, you have to have a specific test that shows that metric. And they've got dozens, maybe hundreds of these metrics on their website that they're pushing people to use. I think that's a, a smart move and it's a move in the right direction. Um, are companies using this yet? Well, maybe not so much, but I think they will increasingly, right? I mean, Bonnie, that's that's what you heard uh, during your interview. Yeah, and that's what I've seen. There, there. I mean, the amount of organizations that I said are that are joining in their growth that and the variety of them indicate the answer is yes. Especially when you have these leaders that are getting it at, uh, from the from their own employees, from their own shareholders. There's just enough encouragement that they they want to have the metrics and then be able to compare them. And I'm sure as time goes on, they'll be rated and and things and you know in, in terms of their implementation. Stephen, do you think we will? You know, we go to conferences all the time, physical conferences, and we go to Vegas and you think there'll be some meter somewhere up top that says, you know, and this is how much carbon was consumed to bring 6,000 people to a conference in Vegas. Well, I, have seen some companies, <laughs> I have seen some companies thinking about that. Now, honestly, right now with technology the way it is, I don't think there's any way to really reduce that too much except by being smarter about ticketing and travel and so on. But I mean, ultimately, um, I've been to conferences where the conference organizers bought carbon carbon credits to offset the L cost of the whole conference. That for KubeCon, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Can you get me a soapbox? Because <laughs> I've got to step up. <laughs> right, Alan. Elon. Step up. That's what you're no, no, let, let me explain this. Let me, let me tell everybody in Hyde Park to get off the box. Here <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I've said this before about things. When will we get serious as an industry about sustainability when our customers demand it, when people are willing to withhold money and they're going to say, I'm willing to pay to make it sustainable? That's when we'll make this happen. And I don't see that happening when a good portion of our population supports agendas that say there's no such thing as climate change, that wind power causes cancer and kills bald eagles, and all the other nonsense conspiracy theories that get thrashed about in this country. Until that, until people rise up and say, bull crap, this is serious and it's important to us and we need to pay for it because our kids' lives and our grandchildren's lives are dependent on it, it's often not. 
and I'll step off my soapbox right there. All right. I got to go find that, a your Roblox shout out. <laughs> you're good with it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mitch. What? No, other than that, you're you're all for it, right? Well, other than that, yeah. No, I'm a big I'm a big supporter I know you are. of it. I, I think we are. But I think a lot of people talk about it, give you the wink wink, because at the end of the day, it's drill, baby, drill. And and by the way, that's not just one party. Go look at the increase in in oil and gas production more under today than we have. This is absolutely you know, the highest output. And we don't have neither candidate for president wants to do anything about fracking or any of this other stuff. So wow. it is what it is. And in, until that changes, I don't know if we can really have the the muscle we need for these things. Well, well, it's we'll definitely, three mile I think island. It's, yeah, I think it's growing just from the, looking at this organization and their impact and also the AI and data center demand and that a big part of that. And there are government incentives to have more solar and more wind so that that's where you are. Today there it. are. They may yeah. go away depending. Yeah. I think we're all betting at this point on, you know, these technologies that are going to consume carbon and find places to store it and take it out of the atmosphere because I think we're past the point of, making any material no, difference. No. I, I actually read an article on that today. Some some folks are experimenting with changing the chemistry of the sea mm -hmm. that would allow us to be 2,000, it would allow it to be like 2,000 times more carbon dioxide it would be able to absorb. What could go wrong? What could I, possibly I, I, go wrong? I, 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 I don't like it. I'm now officially terrified because I read that article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Starting so, your own fish tank. Don't start with the sea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Bonnie, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I will be at this conference that they're having in Austin, Texas uh, next month. Um, and speaking of big people that are coming, I'm going to be hosting a fireside chat with the chief sustainability officer of Dell. Really? Yes. Very I didn't cool. get to tell you that. It happened yeah. Friday. Yeah. So um, it, they're just getting the demand and the interest from a variety of companies. It's a global that, that's going in. Um, and I'm very honored to be part of it. And actually, speaking of that, today I'm on my way to Miami for the Smart, Smart Cities Conference, where we may address some of the things we were talking about earlier with um, managing traffic and energy and urban infrastructure. So there's just a lot of movement in this space overall with lots of people with great ideas. And that's why Bonnie is who she is, right? We need people like her banging this drum and, and, and leading it. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for what you do. All right. I think that's going to wrap up today's Tech Strong Gang. It was, it was an interesting gang. Three Mile Island. Whose idea was that? <laughs> um, we will be back tomorrow. Hey, Stephen, when's the next Tech Field Day? Uh, today. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> so we're actually uh, doing an exclusive event uh, with Nokia, uh, literally uh, right now, as people are watching this, uh, we're going to be going live probably right after Tech Strong Gang airs. Um, cool. And then uh, we've got another event coming up, uh, AI Data Infrastructure Field Day, which is all about uh, the data storage support for AI. That's uh, October 2nd and 3rd. Fantastic. Very cool stuff. All right. Well, everyone. We do have a full Tech Field Day after this and, and more Tech Strong TV. Stephen, one thing we didn't mention also, if you ever want to watch any of the old Tech Field Days, the, the Tech Field Day YouTube channel. Yeah, absolutely. Just go to YouTube slash Tech Field Day. There's tons and tons of great content out there. Um, we're going to be posting all the Edge Field Day stuff today uh, as well. And so you'll be able to uh, catch some of the stuff that I talked about earlier in the episode. So every day is a Tech Field Day. Yeah. Every day could be a tech field day. I would make Stephen a happy camper. Can yeah. we do it sustainability-wise, though? Yeah. They're carbon neutral. <laughs> All right. Hey, we're out of here. Have a great day, everyone. Happy Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow for more Tech Strong Gang.